words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Lisa said, for Protestants, folk, or for uh, Protestants, there's been a 500-year drought. And then, it seems to me, relatively recently, something's happening. Why is that? And then, fire away with the questions. Um, let me qualify that and say, uh, it's been a 500-year drought with the visual arts, certainly not with music. Um, the way I would answer that question right now um, would point out that what's happening in the United States is not happening in Europe. So there's something going on here, and the little trajectory as I dug into that question is the Depression, uh, the Works Progress Administration, the first federal funding for art in the United States happened during the Depression. Mm -hmm. That built a network of communities who had experience with um, external funding and working in, for public. All of those works were, were done for the public. That manifested itself in the next generation of artists in the establishment of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts in 1965. Catherine Bloom worked very hard to get art as a content area in education. And once you have something designated as a content area, you need to train people to teach it. And that's why those K through 12 educators are so important. Almost every art department in the United States began because primary school teachers needed to take a class in art. Hmm. And once you need art classes in every college and university in the country, you need MFAs to teach those classes. And it's a fascinating system that's part of our public governmental hmm. history that lands us in the United States with a quarter of the population being a self-identified artist or knowing somebody who is a self-identified artist, which would not have been the case in 1930. So that's how I would answer that question. Um, Lisa, a question for you. It's two separate questions. One is uh, Catholicism and, and Orthodox and Protestantism. As an Anglican, where, where do I land? And what does that look like is one. And two, um, uh, if the um, Western ways to inter have this art be interpreted, what do the communal arts have to do with that? Like how can drama, dance, these, kind, choir, these kinds of things affect that? Thank you. Yes, thank you for reminding me, someone always does, <laughs> that the Anglicans and the Lutherans um, are, are not kind of part of the trajectory that I sketched out because they always had more capacity. Their intent was never to take it out entirely. The Anglicans did have a about of iconoclasm. Uh, but that wasn't about the illegitimacy of art per se. That was about wealth, which is a complicated and related question. Um, so there, uh, I would say in the United States, the Grunewald Guild and ECVA are two very vigorous organizations working in the Lutheran and Anglican confessions. And there's always been energy and interest. Um, I, I just have a little less expertise in those areas. But I also think they haven't gotten the robust support and channeling and instruction and training that people get in the Orthodox and, and Catholic churches. Um, now, quick remind me of your second. Communal art. Oh, communal art, yeah. Um, certainly dance and theater. I mean, theater is great. We teach, in, we teach visual artists to work all by their lonesome. And if they collaborate or feel like they're being influenced too much, that provokes a great deal of anxiety. And I look across our patio at the theater department and say, get over the collaboration anxiety. Um, but I would also just want to challenge us in the visual arts to not take it for granted that everything is so privatized and individualized and make the visual arts work a little bit more like those more collaborative forms. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you a question, but first let me say, I think, yeah, great art can be transformational, absolutely. Um, in the 1980s, looked up the Sistine Chapel before it was clean, smudgy, dirty, eh. Went back uh, 10 years later after it had been cleaned and the colors popped. But that wasn't what really grabbed me. The guy said, what's the focus of that work? And of course everybody said, oh, it's where God is touching Adam and they're about to touch with their fingers. And he said, 
come to the center of the Sistine Chapel and look up and tell me that. So we did. That was not the center of the painting. The center of the painting was Eve, tucked safely under the arm of God, using the same line of sight as God in that picture. And the guy who suggested this was a subversive painting. Michelangelo was making a statement. It took us 500 years to figure it out. She wasn't the inferior second banana in this story. She was central to the understanding of what it is to be human and far from being the one who eats the apple and leads us into sin. Therefore, every human being with a uterus has to submit to a husband and or to a church and not uh, be allowed the privilege of leadership uh, or authority. Michelangelo will say something quite different, quite radical in that day, and we're only now figuring it out. And powerful, just powerful. So can you give me a couple of examples of Christian art, whether it's visual or theatrical, that really was transformative for you two? Oh, I'm having that video store moment when you've got all of these movies you want to watch in your head and you walk in the door and they all go poof. No, there are so many wonderful pieces. And let me just return to the Sistine ceiling because Michelangelo is so sneaky. Um, first of all, there's an article you would love, Leo Steinberg, Who's Who on the Sistine Ceiling? That's the name of the article, Who's Who on the Sistine Ceiling? And he goes into the question of Eve and everyone else who's in that penumbra with her. And it is a joyful tour de force of committed art historical writing. He's Jewish, but he loves it. Um, and there are also little paired Cupid figures throughout the ceiling. And normally, all Cupids are little male puti, we call them. Um, his are paired, one male and one female. He's the only person in the history of art to have ever done that all the way over the ceiling. Um, a piece of art that I find very moving is a tiny, insignificant piece by a third tier 17th century Dutch artist named Henrik van Steenwijk. Uh, but it snuck up on me and attacked me in the Norton Simon Museum. And it was a painting of the liberation of Peter from prison. And it's a small piece. It's meant to go in a home. Uh, it's, you know, smaller than that screen there. But it shows in the deep, deep, deep recesses of a crypt the angel leading Peter out of jail. And what's so beautiful about that particular picture and why it hit me, I think, is because you can overlook so easily what God is doing. And here God is doing something miraculous, liberating someone from prison, and what you're looking at are all the guards in the front asleep and you're paying attention to the architecture. And um, it's a piece that I like to share with students because it reminds us that um, God isn't always the spectacle on the Sistine ceiling. Sometimes God is doing something that we could walk past and overlook, but God is still doing it. Yeah, it's definitely hard to narrow it down. I would say for me recently, can I zoom out to, it doesn't have to be visual arts? Okay, so the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, you just can read it and read it and read it and go deeper and deeper. Ignatian, Ignatian poet. Uh, and there's a contemporary song called Why Do We Hunger for Beauty by Steve Bell um, that uh, has helped me start to try to do exegesis on, on my own reaction to beauty. There's a great quote when you walk in this room about, I think it says, it's Simone Veal, uh, a longing for beauty is really a longing for the incarnation. It's a song that kind of speaks to that. Um, if you're familiar with the movie Silence, Martin Scorsese's uh, little work of uh, yeah, little work of passion there. Do uh, you have a comment on that? I haven't seen it, so we'll have to go see it. Yes, you should. <laughs> okay. So I have a, a question for either or both of you. I get to um, pastor in sort of in our backyard is the Getty Museum, and I also train spiritual directors, and we have encourage trained directors to become docents so that they can take people on a spiritual encounter. And it occurs to us as we're encouraging that piece, not required to do that, that uh, the first time I ever went to a, an orthodox 
church in worship was when I was in high school. And I had a docent, if you will, who led us through what was happening in worship. And when we send people from the church with spiritual directors who are docents to encounter art either in the cathedral or in one of LA's museums, they come back and say that was such a worship-filled experience. What, what would you encourage pastors for the church or those who are in the academy teaching how do we be better docents of the worship experience given what we learn and encounter out of so much of what you've shared? Uh, first of all, I would affirm the legitimacy of having these deep, profound, moving, and formative experiences. Um, that is a good thing. It, it, I'm an art historian, so my impulse is always going to want to help the docents and the viewers understand what these works were doing originally, and the Getty is great. They have some wonderful pieces in the older parts of the museum that are actually straight out of churches. Um, and then my own interests uh, would bring me to another more complex set of interactions. After the 1700s, the mid-1700s, art starts to substitute for religion for people. Uh, and especially landscape imagery becomes a place where people go for that numinous, transcendent, sublime experience, and it gets confused with a religious experience. So I, I don't want to say that that's bad to have those experiences, but I want people to be a little bit self-aware of whether they're making a category mistake. And that's where trying to point to the continuity I mean, the, during the French Revolution, Jacques-Louis David and his co-workers in the arts were very, very aware that if you take the church away from people, which is what they were trying to do, disconnect church from state, you have to substitute for all those religious festivals. You have to substitute for all those practices and beliefs. And they put state-oriented festivals and practices in their place. Um, so I personally, maybe this is my Calvinism coming through, I get a little bit worried when people think an art experience is the same thing as a religious experience. When the work itself came from a church, you're a little bit closer to safety there. But when the work was generated by an artist in a studio for a secular audience in a home or in a gallery, then there's another layer of interpretation that might need to happen. Um, and I'd love to come and talk to docents about that. <laughs> Can I ask you a question about that? So uh, how, how are you defining a religious experience? Can you, yeah. can you give us a definition for that, what category that is? Uh, well, this, this is where folks in the room have a lot more expertise in language and parsing things than I do. Uh, but the sense that there's something out there beyond yourself that um, is attractive and magnetic and enticing and good for you um, those are the kinds of experiences that many people now have in museums. Uh, and Christians can have those experiences as museums and maybe not, not get terribly confused. But a lot of people who are longing for a religious experience and for whatever reason aren't going to go to church are going to museums and having that kind of affective sensation. Now I want to hear what you would say to me. I, well, I think that awareness of transcendence doesn't have to have come... I, I want to think about it more, so it's an it's a interesting thing, but my initial response is that that uh, awareness of transcendence um, comes from a human being who's an image bearer, whether they know that they are not working with material that God made, whether they know it or not, and that the Holy Spirit can use it as he pleases and that that awareness of transcendence, I don't know if I would call it a religious experience because you're right that it isn't the same as a corporate worship experience, but I would think it, it could be a, a genuine encounter with a living God uh, and that art is facilitating that encounter or at least it puts somebody on the path of invisible things are real. Um, so so I, wouldn't, I would be less concerned probably because of my woeful lack of training in your area, but I would be less concerned about confusing those categories between an aesthetic experience and a religious experience because I think however we get to that awareness um, that invisible things are real and of a transcendence, uh, that that's a, 
that we're heading in the right direction. But I would, I would want somebody to help me exegete that experience. Um, and I would also love to know more about the art that's, that's um, ushering in that kind of awareness. Yeah. This is more uh, pragmatic. So I grew up in a church that champions the arts. Artists are leaders. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, but my artistic giftings are not as connected to what we would do in a worship service. So I'm a writer. And, um, but as, as I think about maybe doing pastoral ministry in the future, I'm concerned about uh, the relationship, which can often be tense, between church leaders and artists. And how would you advise me, thinking on the church leader side, how do I get out of the way of artists in a positive way? and also create a kind of healthy, life-giving partnership. Um, I grew up in one, but I'm less confident of my ability to go recreate that. Great question. What, what did you see in your research? Where was it working? Uh, the churches that had long-term sustainable arts, I called them art-committed churches, um, had two things going for them. One was they had found some there's always a visionary in the congregation that starts it out and kind of gives it a flavor. And if that visionary can find a point of cultural convergence between the identity and mission of the congregation and the world around, that is a really important thing. Then it becomes like the art camp on the hill. That's a powerful cultural convergence. Um, I could give more examples. Um, and then the other thing is to get it into the budget line. <laughs> So it needs to be in the committee structure and in the budget line. And that provides a tremendous amount of continuity and stability for something to transcend uh, the presence or absence of one particular visionary. Mm -hmm.